Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for making out here so early this morning, despite the uh, cold weather. Though it's a little bit late now, let me first extend my uh, New Year's greetings to each one of you, and I truly hope that you will have the best time of the year for this year. Uh, this morning, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Arlen Sinai to you as our guest speaker. As you know very well, he is one of the foremost financial and economic forecasters on Wall Street at the moment. And he also running his own company, consulting company, uh, providing uh, uh, consulting uh, business to more than 300 institutes all over the world. And he is going to give us a talk today on the global economic uh, outlook, as well as regional outlook uh, for this year and beyond. And I guess he will cover the United States and the European Union and China and of course Korea in his talk. Well, as you know very well, the global economy seems to be at a crossroad again after having many shocks last year. The most important one is of course the ongoing debt crisis in Europe. We are really worried about whether European Union can save itself and whether Euro can survive through this turmoil. Unfortunately, we, don't, we still don't see the other end of the tunnel yet. But it is certain that the European crisis will hurt the global economy dearly this year. And recently, uh, we heard some good news about the U.S. economy, and especially last night when I talked with uh, Arlen, and U.S. is making some good progress there. But we still don't know whether the recovery is real. And it is very fortunate to have a number of emerging market economies who are doing very well, including China and India and some others. But the question is whether this high growth will sustain. Given all these risk factors, it seems to me it's a very difficult time to make any forecasting for uh, this year and next year. But, and that's why we have invited Dr. Arlen Sinai, hoping that uh, he will uh, uh, sort out some of these, these difficult uh, risk factors and provide us some good and uh, more clear pictures of the global economy for uh, 2012. Well, I believe most of you are very familiar with Arlen Sinai because we have had him on this stage for so many years now usually as a kickoff speaker in January. So I'll make a very, very brief comment on his uh, uh, career. Well, as I said, he is uh, running a, his own company named Decision Economics, located in New York, and branches in Chicago, Boston, and London. And uh, he established it by himself in 1996. Before uh, that, he worked with the Luhmann brothers for many years, from 1983 to 1996. And there I was the money person, and the rest <laughs> of Lehman were the thinkers. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. Lumen, I think Lehman Brothers failed simply because uh, Dr. Arlen Sinai left the company too early. <laughs> Is it true too? 
I, I left in 1996, and as a client, they left me when they went uh, bankrupt. <laughs> and so uh, we, we uh, like other creditors, we're still in line. <laughs> well, uh, before joining the uh, Lumen Brothers in uh, in nine or in 19. Uh, 83. What, 83, 83, eh? he worked for uh, Data Resource Incorporated, DRI, so-called. You may be very familiar with that company that was founded by late uh, uh, Professor Otto Eckstein, who was a towering figure in econometrics area at the time, and from Harvard University. And I think uh, Eckstein picked him up uh, as a good uh, econometrician too. And both of them... He got me very cheap. Otto was a great entrepreneur, and he knew a bargain when he saw it. He, he, he picked me up for a song, almost no money at all. I was dying to go work for him. He was a great man and a great economist. Yeah. Otto yeah. So uh, he worked there uh, to develop many econometric models for the U.S. economy and the others uh, for quite a time, more than 10 years there. And he worked there as vice president. Uh, when he left, senior vice president, you said. So he has kind of very brilliant, brilliant and good track record in this area. So uh, I think it's very fortunate to have him here over here today in, in this very difficult time. So ladies and gentlemen, let me now present uh, Alan Sinai. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, well, thank you for that very uh, gracious introduction. I apologize for the ad lib uh, interruptions. We did not rehearse that, uh, but I, I, I won't do that again. It, it actually is impolite to interrupt uh, the host, but on the career and uh, memories of uh, Mr. Eckstein and Lehman, uh, when you've been around as long as I have, uh, those long gone situations you remember very well, uh, it's yesterday that's hard. To remember at our, my age, not your age, everyone here is younger than I am. Uh, today, uh, I want to talk about U.S. and global economies and markets in turmoil. In turmoil, what lies ahead? Question mark. I'll ask a lot of questions. I may not give you a lot of answers. Uh, I want to first review uh, the turbulent 2011 a bit uh, to set the stage for thinking about what lies ahead. 2011 was a year of turmoil, turbulence, and volatility in the U.S. and global economies and financial markets. Political and geopolitical instabilities were widespread. Equity markets fell in most countries. Uh, probably the worst performance for equity markets generally that I can remember in decades, uh, you know, except for 2007, uh, but really a terrible year for equity markets. There, uh, almost all countries, uh, equity markets were, were down uh, and down sharply. In the U.S., it, we were flat as a safe haven uh, for funds allocations. Inflation was high early in 2011 on run-ups in commodity prices, oil and energy, and uh, started to move down later in the year. G7 country interest rates stayed low, with the United States Bank of uh, Federal Reserve, Bank of Japan, and Bank of England expanding balance sheets, called quantitative easing, uh, throughout uh, the year. Long-term interest rates for a number of countries whose sovereign debt was in question uh, rose sharply and soared as the Eurozone economic and financial crises worsened and European and European Central Bank policies to stem the crises were too little too late. Unemployment stayed high in many countries. Financial institutions and financial intermediaries in most major countries remained troubled, especially in Europe, where there was extraordinary financial distress and still is for banks in a number of European countries. As for the U.S. and world economies, for economic activity in general, by and large, recovery and expansion continued in 2011. This was a recovery, a world recovery that began in 2009, 
second, maybe third year, depending on the country of recovery, uh, but at a much reduced pace. The world economic aggregate for us, which is 47 countries that we analyze and forecast, grew, uh, real GDP, real economic growth was 3% uh, in 2011. And that was down from a very robust 4.3% in 2010, a sharp downturn in aggregate global growth. By the way, our number, while qualitatively uh, will probably tell the same story as the World Bank forecast or IMF forecast, will be different. Uh, we are not exhaustive in the country coverage. We cover 47 countries. It's about 93% of world output. Uh, and uh, our calibration is different. Uh, the line for the world uh, economy that divides recession and expansion is a positive 2% real GDP growth. It's, it's different. It's positive for the IMF. And so you need to know that and take that into account. But a, a move down from uh, well over 4% to about 3% in global growth is a major slowdown. And that's what happened in 2011, essentially the second year of recovery and expansion. In normally early years in stages of economic recoveries in, in a given country or in the world, don't tail off that fast. Uh, U.S. economic growth was only 1.8%. Uh, we'll get the final number, I think, uh, at the end of next week. It was only 1.8% after a 3% pace in 2010. By the way, 3% uh, in the second year of recovery in the United States is really bad compared with history. Normally, we do 5 or 6%. So this was recovery but as a commented last year, anemic subpar, which is the way I've told audiences is going to be, and is indeed the way it will be in the future. The U.S. is not going to grow anywhere near, under almost any circumstances, the pace of growth that it used to grow in the good old days. We're not a high growth country anymore, uh, either on the short, intermediate term or longer run horizon in our view. So we slowed down quite a bit. Japan's economy went down, we're estimating, half a percent last year after a strong recovery growth rate of 4% the year before. Now, of course, that was in part the natural disasters uh, that occurred in Japan and reverberated around particularly the Asian world. But we're estimating Japanese growth this year at only 1%. So it's more than those disasters that have pushed the Japanese economy away and much lower than that strong recovery, initial recovery upturn that Japan had. China's growth is estimated by us uh, at 9% or a little less, compared with over 10%. At one point, it was 11% year over year, 11.3%, I think, in 2010. And South Korea grew at 3.8%, significantly under what I thought you would do. Shame on you <laughs> for making, for the first time in years, my forecast for South Korea wrong. I was reminded last night because I conveniently forgot. I think I said I thought I had forecasted 4%. That would be very good because it looks like 3.8%. But he reminded me, truth in lending, it was 5%. And so uh, that is a miss, uh, and I think when you hear my remarks about why the global economy faded in 2011, uh, you'll understand why in that context uh, South Korea grew at only 3.8% instead of the Sinai expectation of 5. Almost 4% is not bad in a year like last year, uh, and so uh, you should of course, want to, I think, grow faster. And the country, hopefully, will use policies to do so. But let's face it, Korea is a very open economy, very much driven by exports. And so how other parts of the world do, who buy directly and indirectly much of what is sold by Korean companies, will have a lot to do with how Korea does over the next year or two. 
Well, over the year, a number of countries fell back into recession. It's very unusual in a second or third year of an economic upturn. Very unusual, if not aberrant. Uh, in particular, the Eurozone economies like Greece, Portugal, Ireland fell and fell sharply. Lately, Italy, Spain, Belgium, and the Netherlands have all fallen into another recession. And growth is much weaker in the UK, flirting with recession, and weaker for Germany and France. China and the developing economies all weakened in growth, uh, as did a lot of other countries in the world, but they still grew very nicely. Latin America, as a group of countries, was up over 4% against 6 in 2010. What is called emerging Asia was up 7.5% after a booming 9.3% in 2010. Emerging Europe was strong and stable at about 6% growth all in 2011. The Middle East grew at about 4%. The pattern is clear. Slowdown in Asia, ex Japan, and in the developing world, but still, relative to history and relative to the developed world, very strong and positive growth. Nobody likes activity to slow down, particularly in business, but it's still excellent out here. Uh, and even if it should fade some, as it probably will in Korea, next year won't be as uh, high as almost 4% growth of the last year. It's still, relative to the world and in terms of your businesses, uh, it's good. I think it's good. Well, this uneven economic performance across countries and global regions is slowing some recessions, the most anemic and subpar U.S. economic upturn in modern history, relatively strong growth in China, though slowing, uh, and uh, in the developing world versus the very slow growth, some recessions in the developed or advanced G7 and related economies, can be traced, I think, to four different causes or forces. First, and President Nam mentioned this, shocks. Macro economic shocks, negative ones. More last year than I can remember since the shock-ridden decade of the 1970s when we had geopolitical shocks which caused oil prices to quadruple and then double and then there rises to wreak havoc, recession and inflation on the world. Uh, political shocks a wild decade and difficult decade. More macro shocks, negative ones, emerged during the year. I think I count eight or nine, and we just haven't seen that many. Uh, second was the hangover, the legacies, if you will, from the economic and financial crises of 2007 to 2009. Uh, as we now all recall, the deepest and longest downturn for the U.S. and world economies and a huge financial crisis in the United States uh, than any time since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, with economies and financial institutions, sectors, during 2011 still in the process of healing, correcting huge excesses and imbalances that arose in the Great Recession and Great Financial Crisis of 2007 to 2009. Third were policy errors. Policy errors and policy ineffectiveness, which in a business cycle sense play a large role in the ups and downs of business cycles. It's a force, it's a category of things that have a big effect on the ups and downs in economic activity and the behavior of financial markets, policy errors and policy ineffectiveness in 2011. As the excesses and imbalances of past years were worked out, the leveraging, called the leveraging by the American household sector, I call it reliquification. It's a cyclical process, getting household finances and balance sheets back in shape after a huge deterioration 
in the preceding years. Uh, cautious and uh, financial institutions recovering from uh, surviving, having to recapitalize, dealing with a tough credit environment, unwilling to lend because of the risk, perceived risk to them. And austerity imposed on the sovereign debt-ridden countries by lenders, in this case in the Eurozone, the European Union, Years ago in the Asian crisis, it was the IMF and World Bank. The lender conditionality of punitive austerity measures that lead and induce political backlash and political unhappiness that often leads to political instability, which in turn makes the situation worse. Now, I, along with some other economists, I think Professor Stiglitz, notably, who speaks a lot in uh, the, this part of the world, have always been critical in these crises of the punitive nature of what we call lender conditionality, hoping and thinking that though the conditions must be placed on the uh, debtors so that they get their fiscal situation in appropriate shape, the conditions are too stringent, too punitive, and as a result, the situation gets worse before it can get better. And if the political backlash occurs, as it has this time, look at the changes in leadership in Europe. Look at the political shifts all over the world that all these crises have engendered. That, in turn, becomes a problem in the business cycle because of the uncertainty for everyone in the private sector of who's going to be in charge, what policies will be, it's a negative factor. Uh, and sometimes uh, countries upon whom the austerity is imposed will default, and if they can, devalue the currency. Indeed, that is more the rule rather than the exception. Of the choices available, countries end up, uh, I call it stiffing the creditors, reneging on the sovereign debt, and devaluing the currency. It's very punishing to people in a country when the currency is devalued. The debts that are held externally make uh, the country impoverished in their private sector, but those debts end up forgiven because nobody can pay them back. And after lags of a couple of years, money begins to flow into those countries, and they begin to grow again. And if they mind their P's and Q's thereafter, such as has been the case in Brazil, Argentina, maybe, in a number of countries in Asia, the future can be very bright. Well, the last force has been the political change and instability, whether it's uh, changes in the old guard, the leaders in the Middle East, uh, totalitarian governments, uh, and the, the Arab Spring, uh, whether it's six heads of Japan in three years, uh, whether in the United States it's the inability of Washington to really function and make decisions uh, and big changes in our election of 2010 after a big change in 2008, or in Europe where one leader after another uh, has left. Uh, some for the good, and maybe some not for the good. Certainly in the case of Italy, uh, the current leader of Italy, Mr. Monte, so-called technocrat, a massive, huge improvement over the previous leader, Mr. Berlusconi. There is hope for Italy in the new government, and there is concern about Italy because it is now so deep into its crisis and downturn that it will be hard to find its way out. Well, uh, rarely has there been such a long list of negative macro shocks. And the forces that I mentioned, none of them you notice numerical. None of them multiplier accelerator processes within economies. None of them wealth effects, housing cycles up and down. None of them. The forces that motivated the weakened world economy 
weaker, we revised down during the year three times. And indeed, I think as a byproduct, the uh, quote unquote poor or not as good as I would have liked uh, to see South Korea do. So I want to go through those shocks and do a status check for you as to where we stand. Uh, how many we're going to have, maybe have to deal with this year and their status. If only to show you how different the picture is at the beginning of the year than it turned out to be last year. When I was here a year ago, the Arab Spring hadn't happened. Oil prices had not shot up. The Japan natural disasters had not happened. China was trying to disinflate. That was ongoing. The Eurozone crisis was ongoing. It had been going on now for over two years. We were concerned about the American consumer. And the Federal Reserve a year ago was thinking about exiting quantitative easing. Toward the middle of the year, they tossed that aside because the economy underperformed for so long. So a lot happened after I was here. This is not an excuse for being wrong on a forecast, but a lot happened. Uh, and we can't say that this year, because I'm going to tell you that there are many fewer of these shocks around, it's a cause for optimism. And the ones that are still around, we have a better idea of their impact than we had during last year. But as last year taught us, as the events of the last five and ten years have taught us, these tail risks, these shocks, these events that come out of, if you're a baseball fan, far left field that you don't see it, or far right, the far right or the far left, either, I've got to be neutral here, uh, can happen. And all we do as an organization is analyze it as much as we can quantitatively, and if it necessitates changes in our forecast, we make them, and we try to explain to our clients and others what it all means. Just one note prior to looking at the shocks, uh, then impact, and the 2012 prospect, it's that hangover, that force I mentioned, the legacies of the 2007-2009 crisis and the ineffectiveness of policy, especially in the United States, massively easier monetary policy and stimulated fiscal policy. For, for monetary policy and its ease, not just the United States, but also Japan, aggressively easy on monetary policy, quantitative easing, there, the Bank of England, the ECB now we think will cut rates, may quantitatively ease, pouring funds into the banking system to keep banks going, not, though, going to buy in a permanent fashion the sovereign debt of fiscally irresponsible countries directly. The European Central Bank, no central bank can do that. But to provide a lot of liquidity to banks, to keep banks going, that is the proper function uh, for a central bank and central bankers. Well, we have in the world, if you step back and look at it, a massive, huge global liquidity trap, characterized, much like the 1930s, characterized by, in the US and elsewhere, one, households, consumers, reliquifying, rebalancing, grossly unbalanced balance sheets, deleveraging, if you will, not spending much in the process, saving more, and scared, sitting on cash, worried about retirement. This is prevalent in the United States, prevalent in Japan, uh, other countries in the world, may not be so much here, uh, but it's a pattern. You can see it. It's a, it's a liquidity trap, a holding of cash, a reluctance to let go of the cash, even though returns in most countries are close to zero. You know, I had a good year last year on some of my money. I had deposits in the Bank of China in New York. That says something about my view of the dollar and my view of the Chinese currency, perhaps. I, uh, you know, they, they, have, they have two branches in New York and one in LA, and an American can put deposits in the Bank of China in New York it pays what other banks pay. I get on a passbook account two tenths of a percent, but I figure I'll get three to five percent on currency appreciation because China's 
the currency is undervalued, and they will have to let it appreciate some. So in a, in a world of zero returns on cash, I think I did very well. I earned 3 4% on my money in the Bank of China in New York. Did I take a risk? I don't think so. I think it's very safe. My account is insured by the FDIC of the United States to $250,000, just like any other bank where I would put money. I can borrow if I want, if they think I'm credit worthy. Uh, at that bank. I suspect a lot of the money that is coming from dollars that are deposited in the bank that are turned into the Chinese currency are being lent, my guess is, to the Chinese who run the businesses in Chinatown in New York. So my dollars are financing Chinese enterprise. And I think the Chinese government wants that to happen. This is just one little example of internationalizing the currency which China is doing. Uh, but for me, it was a great investment. Zero in the United States, many people think, last year was a good investment. If you're in the world of managing money and in the business world, that's terrible. But that gives you some idea of the degree of caution and safety. Uh, we'll put my little example aside. Most people don't think that's such a safe thing to do. But I assure you, is it safer than owning a U.S. Treasury bond for a country that is fiscally irresponsible like the United States? I'd have to think about that. It might be. It might be. That's just a provocative comment. I don't necessarily want to get far into that. Financial intermediaries have not been lending. Uh, they're sitting on cash and excess reserves. It's true in Japan, the United States. Hugely averse to taking risks on lending. lending and because of the business uncertainty that exists, and not sure how much capital they're going to end up having because all the regulation hasn't been settled yet. And so there is a huge amounts of cash liquidity trap, a holding of non-low return money, not taking risk. And in the business sector in the United States, great profits, tremendously strong balance sheets, not spending much of those cash holdings, buying back stock, uh, now beginning to pay out some dividends, and just now beginning to hire some people. But rather than hire people, American companies are buying technology. They will keep doing that. And those of you in that line of business, going to U.S. companies, especially the new information technology, infotech, new infotech, hugely solid business, because that's where business is spending money. Why? They want to make profits. They really don't want to hire people. People are expensive. We'd rather replace them with robots, PDAs, anything that's labor saving. And that stuff is cheap. That stuff is cheap. So we see tremendous spending in that area in the United States with some of the cash. But by and large, corporations sitting on terrific amounts of funds. And we see the transmission mechanisms, the traditional ones, the, the housing, the connections between monetary policy and the economy through housing, mortgage finance and housing. That has not been working. We have not seen consumer spending except recently pick up because of the links between easy money and what normally happens. Uh, very, very sticky kind of situation, very unusual. Uh, and what I've just described would be there no matter what shocks occurred last year and would be interfering and in limiting U.S. economic growth. Uh, we, you know, without the shocks last year, we might have grown at two and a half, two and three quarters percent. With all the shocks that hit us and the rest of the world, we grew at 1.8 percent. In fact, it's amazing with all the shocks I'm about to go through that the world economy did stay intact and by and large keep growing. Well, uh, in the um, policy era, we had a lot of those, too, uh, as well as part of the landscape that existed in the face of all of the shocks. And the shocks I'm about to mention made policymaking more difficult, as well as issues for policy of in underperforming economies like the U.S. and Japan, two of the three biggest economies in the world, and China trying to slow down. How in the world do you design policies to keep it going? 
And if, in the case of the United States and Japan, you are financially constrained on the fiscal side, which those two countries are, we have huge budget deficits, 100% debt to GDP ratio on the gross public debt basis now, uh, the U.S. cannot afford stimulative macro policies anymore. And so the policy context is very different. How do you grow the economy, lower the unemployment rate, and get the budget deficit and growth of debt relative to GDP down all at the same time? That's tough. Tough policy uh, issue and uh, tougher to figure out the solutions to it. Eventually, a real upturn should take hold. But the developing world, increasingly the haves, in my view, will outperform, far outperform, the developed or advanced economies. And when, if the risks subside sufficiently, equity market performance should reflect the fundamental decoupling of the performance and future of the developing versus the developed world. The question, one question, as President Nam mentioned, is can the developing world sustain the high growth that now exists relative to the developed world? We think the answer is yes, but that remains to be seen. At some point, if the decoupling in performance stays, equity markets, if risks are not so many, will reflect that, and stock markets of the developing or emerging world South Korea is already advanced, but I would include the South Korean stock market in that, will soar and far outperform uh, the G7 equity markets of the world. That didn't happen, did not happen last year. Well, the negative shocks, are they still there or not? In order last year, let me uh, go through them and let you know what we think about their state at this time, at the beginning of 2012. Now, the Arab Spring, the political upheavals in the Middle East, which gave rise to a speculative move up in crude oil and energy costs on the fear that oil supplies would be interrupted, uh, that the uh, Mideast world would uh, blow apart. Oil prices shot up to $120, $125 a barrel. Gasoline price in the United States, $4.5 uh, per gallon. U.S. sentiment went way down. It definitely took a half, three-quarters of a percentage point of growth out of the U.S. economy last year, in our view. Oil price increases out of something like what occurred last year are both inflationary and recessionary. And if central banks tighten in response to the inflation, which happened a lot in Asia outside of Japan, a lot of interest rate increases because inflation picked up through the commodity price channel uh, and interest rates went up, that hurts. That's recessionary. And so this factor definitely affected the outcomes of 2011. Uh, this is now a stable uh, outside shock. <clears throat> it is not a factor. Uh, the Arab Spring goes on in a geopolitical sense, unsettled. Uh, changes in, in leaders in a number of countries with one more to go, probably Mr. Assad, uh, who I would venture to say will not uh, be in charge at the end of this year. Uh, and uh, the risk on this uh, score is, of course, Iran and the potential for conflict uh, between Iran and Israel, the U.S., Iran, Iran and anybody, which will center around oil supplies and lead to, if there were a huge conflict, uh, sharp rises in oil, energy costs, inflation around the world, and depending on how long it lasted, how it worked out, inflationary and recessionary. We think we can figure out oil price increases and what that does, by and large, and work our way through it because we've had quite a few of those in the last 40 years. The big ones were in the 70s, so, uh, but uh, never uh, good. It's always a bad event uh, when it happens. But right now, not there. One negative shock aside. The Japan disasters, I'm going chronologically now uh, through last year. There's one nobody ever had to analyze, tragically so. Earthquake, floods, radioactive nuclear problems, horrible tragedies in Japan, and damage to Japanese psychology, and huge problems for policymakers to try to deal with, dealt with by fiscal support, by running bigger deficits. So in part now, from that, 
Japan that the GDP ratio was about 200 percent. I was just in Japan talking to senior level policymakers. They're hugely worried about this intent, the new prime minister's intent on closing the gap uh, of that hugely uh, potentially uh, devastating fiscal situation, uh, which you know if it stays five years from now, as rich as Japan has been, that's a country that could go bankrupt. It's unsustainable. Uh, but that tragedy, we did our best to analyze. For sure it had a big effect, Japan showing up with negative a half percent growth, and reverberated through supply side chain effects throughout Asia, touched the United States, hurt purchase of autos, they weren't there for a while, and probably damaged the world economy about a quarter of a percentage point. That's gone now. That happens once in hundreds of years. That's gone. That's how rare that event was, but it had significant impact. Then we had an external shock for most of the world, China disinflation. A big negative in 2011 is China purposely moved its economy from a boomy 11% plus state down to slower growth, hopefully a soft landing, viewed as growth in the 7 to 8% range and inflation lower and acceptable. That would be 4% or below uh, for China. Uh, that's still very good growth. And 9% is the number for 2011, a little lower, we think, for 2012. But it's the change from the 11 plus down to 8 that injects negative dynamics in economies that are touched by China uh, in commodity prices under downward pressure. But we think it's over. We think China's attempt to disinflate has been successful. 4.1% uh, rate of inflation year over year against five months ago 6.6%. And now an economy that's weakened enough both on the export side, in part because of the Europe recession, and because of the internal attempts by China to slow it down. It's weak enough, so the Chinese are worried that it could overshoot on the downside and are starting to stimulate. A year ago, no one knew when China would stop disinflating and try to stimulate. It was all China would still keep on disinflating. Now, this outside shock to the world from the second largest economy in the world is, in a forward-looking way, a positive, provided their inflation rate stays down and they do not re-emerge into an another boom, which is really very unlikely. This is a plus. This is a plus. It's a plus for South Korea. It's a plus for Japan. A stabilized growth rate from China, not one that is declining, and the prospect in response to the stimulus that is now being put into the Chinese economy, both on the monetary side, not yet on the fiscal side, is that 6, 12, 18 months down the road, the Chinese economy will no longer be declining and it may turn up in growth from where it is. That's a very different business backdrop for those of you who do business with China and for the South Korean economy in general than the one we had last year going forward. This is a big plus. And you know, it's about the only policy in the world that I could point to and say, roughly, they got it right. Now, none of us know enough about China. Their country is not transparent. You know, deep down in China, the real estate problems, the property price problems, the financial institutions, the way that the government works, the data even, we're all suspicious of it. But I would have to say, this is a rare instance of a country's policymakers, at the moment, it looks like they got it right. Soft landing, 8% growth, 7% growth, 6%. That's our hard landing number. But you know, roughly in that range, it's better than most other countries do on policy when they're faced with a similar situation. Well, we watch it. We'll see if it will hold. But that, as an external macro shock over now, is a big plus. The Eurozone crises, economic, it's financial, it's political, it's societal. This is a moment of truth in the history of Europe. We are living through a momentous period in history, watching what goes on in Europe. The Europeans are. We don't know how that's going to turn out. That's still a huge ongoing negative macro risk 
and I'll come back to that one later. We had, and we worried about the American consumer at the beginning of last year. That one's gone. The American consumer is getting lively, picking up, not like the good old days, but aggregate consumption, 70% of the U.S. economy, fundamentally, shows reasons for and is picking up. Big plus for South Korea, for Japan, for the businesses that export into the United States. We're projecting for the U.S. 25 to 3% growth this year. That's nothing compared to history in the third and fourth years of recovery when we do 5 and 6%. But compared with 1.8%, it's an improvement. You will feel it in your business that is directly and indirectly tied to the United States. And then finally, uh, not finally, we, we, have, uh, uh, we have Washington. Uh, our fiscal problem and the 2012 election. Last year, Washington was a macro shock. Totally unpredictable policy, dealing with our long-run deficit problems, uh, dealing with short-run stimulus. Washington could not be uh, figured out. Uh, they can't figure themselves out down in Washington. Uh, Americans now look at the Washington scene, uh, the executive branch, the congressional bodies, uh, with disgust and distaste. Uh, it is a not, it is a poorly functioning governance. It's a $3.7 trillion operation. You couldn't possibly run a business that way. You wouldn't have a job. And Americans increasingly feel that way about our representatives in Washington. So we don't know how that's going to play out in the election of 2012. But certainly the fiscal situation is a big deal uh, we had a debt ceiling crisis last year. External shock is more of a market thing. We had uh, a deal in August to cut spending. We set up a super committee that failed to come to an agreement. So we now have a sequester of $1.2 trillion of enforced spending reductions set for the beginning of 2013. We had two commissions on the long-run problems of the deficit. The President of the United States ignored them both and didn't pick up any of that, despite the fact that one of them he appointed. And Congress went home fighting about a temporary extension of unemployment insurance benefits and Social Security tax cuts and set up a two-month extension. It's an embarrassment to have to talk about this to a country where, though you, I'm sure, are critical, as in every country, people are critical of their government. Are there any leaders anywhere in the world that get high poll ratings? Everybody in every country you go to is critical. Uh, but for us, uh, it's an embarrassment to have to talk about this. It's, it's, uh, uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, and then, of course, we have the markets, terrible stock markets, which have an effect on psychology and the economy. Well, what's left is, I think, the big ones, Eurozone, uh, Washington, the 2012 election, and, of course, Iran, geopolitical. I'm going to put that aside and concentrate on the risks to the basic picture I'm going to present of the world economy to you in a quick way, and then I'll come back to the risks, uh, the ones that are left, and cross my fingers that between now and, God willing, a year from now, a whole bunch of stuff doesn't happen to make it worse, that a whole bunch of stuff happens to make it better. We're not conditioned after six or seven or eight years of all of these problems. Crisis here, crisis there, crisis everywhere. Sounds like a nursery school rhyme. We're not conditioned to that. We are conditioned to that. Could one of these days, like the weather, we get surprised on the upside. And something's happened this year that will cause us to revise up our forecasts, especially as we look at 2013. Right now, I can't say that I think that, but last year at this time, I don't think I'd have to live through all the shocks that I just went through and what that might mean. Well, the lay of the land, big picture sense here at the beginning of 2012 is two of the three big global regions, two of the three lumps in the sphere of the world are actually, in a forward-looking sense, look pretty good. I couldn't say that a year ago. One lump is the United States lump. Fourth quarter growth, 3.5% at an annual rate, motivated, we think, by some liveliness in consumption 
We see it in a lot of indicators. We see it in the processes. We fundamentally see it because American consumers have cut debt way down. And though they have not fully delivered, they have moved in the direction of better finances and are now able to spend some more. We see it in consumer sentiment. We see it in retail sales. We see it in businesses spending a little more money because demand is higher. And we see it in the jobs market, which is terrible by historical comparisons, improving on a month-to-month, -month, quarter by quarter basis. And that is helping generate more income, make people feel better. And you have this self-sustaining, reinforcing uplift, fundamentally driven by 70% of the US economy. And the consumer is a very big deal. The US consumer, in aggregate, is a very big deal for Japan, South Korea, China, less so for Europe. Very significant. We trace much of the waves in economic growth around the world in the last eight years to big shifts in consumer spending. Now, we're not talking about a big shift here. We're talking about 2.5% for the year in real terms for the growth of consumption. Historically, we, our trend rate of growth for the American consumer was 3.5% a year, inflation adjusted. We're talking about 25 But 25 is better than zero, than one, than one and a half. It's that motion when you're in business that matters. It should be better, those of you who are tied to the American consumer. And it should help out China. It should help out Japan. We buy a fair amount now from China. Uh, the other big lump region is uh, China and Asia x Japan, particularly China. In a forward-looking sense, we have no doubt that the numbers that come out of China will keep on deteriorating. Uh, and that is a business reality for maybe the first half of this year. From a market point of view, as soon as we see a country beginning to stimulate its economy and having gotten inflation under control so they don't have to tighten to get inflation down, the handwriting is on the wall. They will make their economy better. Six, 12, 18 months down the road with lags, their economy will be better. Stock markets react right away in anticipation. As a business person, you can't. It's still too speculative. You've got to wait till you see better sales and better business prospects coming from this area. But the government of Japan and the People's Bank of China are trying to stimulate now, not aggressively, and that is very different from what they did last year. So not so much this year, but next year from China helps out in this region of the world. The unfortunate problem is the uh, Eurozone uh, problem. Now, for the various regions of the world, just very quickly, in terms of this year's growth, this year's growth and the recessions of this year in various countries are going to reflect the stuff that went on last year. Uh, and so it's now written in the numbers, a lot of bad numbers. The global growth figure we have for 2012 is 25 to 2 and 3 quarters percent, which is down from last year's 3 percent, which is down from the 4.3 of 2010. That is not far from recession territory for the, for the global economy, which would be under 2 percent. The reason it's positive is trend growth in the high growing countries lifts the baseline around which you mark expansion or recession. For us, it's a plus two. So two and a half to two and three quarters means the global economy is vulnerable. Where is the biggest weakness? Well, it's Japan, 1 percent growth. Could be worse. It's, of course, the Eurozone, minus 1% for the Eurozone. It's depression, bankruptcy, probably default for Greece, down 6%. The country is a nit on the world horizon. But it's recession in Portugal, recession in Ireland, recession in Italy, recession in Spain, a slower growth in uh, Germany. Germany had a negative fourth quarter. We think that won't stay, but it could. France, slower growth. Eurozone in Europe, recession. The question is how big, how long? No doubt, recession. The forecast is recession that started in the fourth quarter lasts until into the third quarter of 2012. So it doesn't go away. And if we're wrong, we think it'll be worse, not better. And as far as after the recession, the situation, the sovereign debt, financial crisis, the political upheaval, the difficulty of governance and what Europe will actually be. 
Will we have a euro with fewer countries? Will we have no eurozone or euro? How many countries, if any, will leave? Will they leave voluntarily or be forced to leave? How many defaults and bankruptcies might we have on a country basis? How bad will it be for financial institutions who hold that debt? How severe will an ongoing credit crunch be? And how much money can the ECB pour into the situation to hold the line so it doesn't turn into a severe situation? And how about the exposures of the world to the Eurozone economic downturn, particularly if it gets worse? Well, in the case of uh, uh, the U.S., our exposure is, is not so big to uh, recession in Europe. Uh, 13, if we exclude the U.K., 13.5% of our exports go to the euro area. The U.S. Uh, economy is 13% open on exports. The GDP exposure is fairly small. Case of Korea, uh, the export GDP ratio is somewhere in the 40% range? More than. More than, more than that. More than, yeah. So it's huge. Yeah, so your exposure to Europe and exposure through China's exposure to Europe is quite significant. Europe is a very big issue macro-wise in terms of how it goes. But the U.S. can help out the world. We sell and buy a lot from Canada. We sell and buy a lot from Mexico. And Mexico and Canada are not touched so much by the Asian region on trade and certainly not so much by Europe. So the U.S. is in a bit of a self-contained uh, igloo, protected, relatively speaking. And if we pick up, then those demands will flow back through trade to other countries that are open more to Europe. But let's not kid ourselves. If this is a severe, long downturn in Europe, the three point three to three and a quarter percent forecast we have for Korea will turn out to be too high. If the U.S. surprises on the upside, which is one of our scenarios, then maybe three to three and a quarter will be too low. Three and a half, three and three quarters. Four percent looks out of the question here uh, at this moment. Uh, three to three and a quarter. Uh, I hardly missed it except for last year, so let's hope I get back on track. That is not a bad year, and next year, as we get through all this in a bigger way, we would expect to see uh, stronger growth, particularly coming from China to South Korea and head back up to 4% and maybe better. Now, I am not a, a, a close student of the Korean domestic economy. I'm talking about the macro picture as it affects Korea through trade, since you are so open an economy. Uh, and, of course, financial markets affect you as, as well. Uh, we regard that picture as positive. And the other uh, Asian, uh, except for Japan, picture as positive. And this part of the world, ranging from Singapore to Malaysia, the Philippines, yes, still China, uh, South Korea, uh, in Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, as uh, countries that we advise our clients to be overweight in equity-wise, in whose currencies, by and large, uh, we are positive on. Now, the Korean won uh, has actually gone down against a couple of major currencies. I, I can tell you Japan is not happy with that uh, at the policy-making levels in Japan. Uh, but we would still think on fundamentals, relatively speaking, uh, we would expect some appreciation against the dollar on the Korean won and certainly against the euro uh, and against the uh, other Asian currencies uh, I won't make a, a comment. It is a very competitive area on exports, and it is not odd for countries to try to favor, uh, through policies, uh, exchange rate differentials that will benefit their exports, especially if they are very, very uh, open. Uh, so the recession is in Europe and the Eurozone. Latin America, three and a half, three and three quarters percent growth against four and a quarter last year. Uh, the Middle East, Steady at three and a half, four percent. Canada, uh, a little, about the same as last year, and better next year. Uh, the UK, hardly growing. 
this year and next year. The advanced economies, the G7 countries, showing unenviable slow growth and recession in Europe and even Germany, hardly growing at all. That's the picture. In that global picture, we would expect inflation rates in most countries to tend down and central banks to be supportive. Where zero interest rates are in place, they will stay. And countries like Japan, the U.S., U.K., maybe the ECB, might do some more quantitative easing. Monetary policy will be on hold and supportive. Cheap money almost everywhere, which ultimately will light up private sectors in lots of economies and bring us eventually a much better business cycle upturn. Now, the eurozone risk is the big one. We have three scenarios and have had three scenarios all along. And I can't tell you today which one is going to happen. I can only point them out. Uh, one is muddle through, which is what they do. Uh, observing a problem, a financial issue on banks or for a country, and dealing with it as it happens. Uh, too little, too late, and not setting up mechanisms that those of us in the markets and analysts have uh, felt they should do. Uh, the policymakers come around to it, but by the time they come around to it, the dynamics of the situation have gone beyond them, and they are way behind. Repeated examples of this in the case of the uh, Eurozone crises. The first fundamental mistake, I think, was not to let Greece go. Look at it now. It's like you have a bad division in your company, poorly performing. You keep it in your company. It drags down the whole company. It is now so obvious that they can't pay the debt and that the amount of funds that has to be put up, which will eat up most of the pot that they've been able to gather to fund these countries, would go to Greece. And Greece isn't even doing the reforms that the lenders want Greece to do. It's a waste of money. So uh, anything could happen at any time. Uh, if they do come to an agreement with Greece and the private creditors this week, uh, my view is that will be temporary and that Greece, one way or the other, will default. You don't want to hold any Greek debt. I don't think anybody here does. You don't want to hold any Portuguese debt because they're next. You don't want to hold any Spanish debt. And be careful about the Italian debt just to be risk averse. Because the Eurozone has not established a mechanism to provide funds to help Italy get over its trillion plus euro refinancing of this year. Italy is solvent, but it has a huge amount of refinancing to do as the third largest outstanding debt, sovereign debt in the world. Number one is the U.S., number two is Japan. Uh, you don't want this country, you don't want to ever go there again. Don't get the debt in the first place. The lenders will never forgive you, and you have to go through all this pain and trouble, which they are now going through. So uh, uh, we're not, so muddle through is what they've been doing, and look at the results. Tremendous volatility, recessions are getting worse, Country after country does not make the deficit GDP target because they slash government spending if indeed they really do it. And then the enforced austerity hurts the economy. The economy is being hurt for other reasons. There's a financial crunch. People can't get funds, so the economy weakens. GDP goes down. And even though you're cutting the deficit, the deficit to GDP ratio doesn't go down. And debt to GDP, as so long as there's deficits, grows. So the debt to GDP ratio Goes, and the lenders punish them every time they don't make their targets. It is a death spiral for countries that are involved in it. And the only thing for a country to do is what the people in those countries basically are saying when they riot, leave. Take the pain of leaving. It's better than the pain of staying. But we don't know. So another scenario is break apart. Uh, I think you hear a view that Greece one way or the other will leave and probably Portugal, which is moving into default territory, uh, would follow. And we will have, in this scenario, a skinny down Eurozone, still a Euro, still with a laudatory view of history, which was political to make sure tragedies in Europe, conflict did not happen. Just better 
economies, smaller countries, if that were the outcome, other than selling the chaos and the crisis as a trader, initially, I would be a buyer of the euro, big time. Fewer countries, better shape, better governance, the bad ones out. That's a very good picture looking ahead. Indeed, the bad ones, let's say Greece leaves, creates a transitory or a new currency, the new drachma, something in between to have some money. Its external debts make everyone impoverished. Uh, I would sell it while that's happening, and then you know what? As a speculation, I would probably buy the Greek stock market after. I can bet you that lots of money, even if Greece walks, crashes, told they can't get money from anybody, the money will come. Distressed investors looking for bargains. That's the history of every country that has gone through this. And with their own currency, they can freely fluctuate and move down to lower levels, which will help their exports. I personally think they'd be better off. But this is a very complicated problem. The third scenario is political and fiscal union. That's what the leaders of Europe want and always have wanted. Do any of us think that can happen with 17 different countries in the culture of Europe? I wish I thought it could. That's yet another scenario. Chancellor Merkel, President Sarkozy, Jean-Claude Trichet, when he was there, were working very hard to achieve it. They are making some progress on fiscal union. Uh, it is taking so long. You're going to have three or four bankrupt countries before they can ever sign the paperwork. It's a problem. The exposures, as I've mentioned it, at this point, the macroeconomic exposure around the world is too big to ignore. <clears throat> and it is the number one potential source of a global recession this year, which is why the stock markets do what it does. Well, finally, I close on Washington. Uh, the lay of the land in Washington is a, is a very interesting situation. I don't think too many people realize it. Did you know that on our law now and on the books of the United States, we now have, unless we change the law, a $6 trillion planned deficit reduction beginning in 2013. We didn't really plan this to happen. It happened by accident in Washington because of all the failed negotiations. And here's where the number comes from. We did a deal in August to set up the super committee. As part of the deal, $900 billion of government outlays beginning in 2013 are scheduled to be cut. The super committee failed to come to an agreement. Big disappointment. And in the law that Washington set up to force them to come to an agreement that they didn't come to was a $1.2 trillion sequester to begin in January 2013. Across the board reductions in government outlays, almost $600 billion cut in defense. So on the law right now is $2.1 trillion of outlay reductions beginning in 2013, extending over 10 years. At the end of 2012, the Bush tax cuts expire. That would raise $3.5 trillion over 10 years for the federal government. $3.5 trillion plus 2.1, $5.6 trillion of deficit reduction on the books. All of this expires unless Congress changes it during this election year. And half a trillion called the alternative minimum tax. That they have to do every year. More families get hit by something called the alternative minimum tax unless Congress each year uh, decides to alter that. They have every year since the problem arose, kicking the can down the road on that one. That's $6 trillion. $6 trillion over 10 years is $600 billion a year of deficit reduction. The composition of it is over 60% tax increases and less than 40% outlay cuts. No one has suggested that if we reduce the budget deficit, we have that mix. The commissions that studied this for many months, the Simpson Bowles, Bull Simpson and Dementia Rivlin commissions, argued $3 of outlay reduction and $1 of revenue increases. It's amazing. $600 billion a year in fiscal contracts in the United States beginning in 2013. This is the law now, unless we change it. Uh, with 40, 60% of that tax increases on our models, our work, I would have to forecast a recession. Indeed, 
if this is what it ends up, I will say now, we'll have a recession in 2013, 2014. Now, nobody, least of which me, believes that Washington is stupid enough to let these laws stand this way. They have come to this result, $6 trillion of deficit reduction, when the biggest number anybody tried to get, President Obama, was $4 trillion over 10 years. They're just beginning to realize, kind of waking up after a drinking party where everybody went mad and threw food at each other. That's Washington. That's my picture of Washington. It's unbelievable. By accident, not by plan, not by reason, this is what the business of American government has given us. No wonder I'm depositing money in the Bank of China in New York. Do I really want to own the dollar? A country that ends up giving us this lay of the land? Well, I can tell you that no one wants those kinds of tax increases, not even President Obama. He is for, and he will be one of the candidates, and I'll give you a few glimpses of what the candidates will say, and, and, and we'll, we'll agree that we, we don't think that Washington will actually do what is now they've given us in the law. But if you look at the behavior of Washington, I can't tell you and promise you that they won't do something stupid. They've, what I've just told you is they ended up with something totally stupid. So why won't they do something stupid in a presidential election year and not do anything until after the election and then whoever is president has to deal with a humongous, huge fiscal contraction. That would take the U.S. into recession and would not help South Korea, would not help China, wouldn't have, can't help Canada and Mexico. It's amazing. Well, President Obama will run on uh, keeping the Bush tax cuts for middle and lower income families and keeping the capital gains tax and dividend preferential rates uh, at the same level for middle and lower income families. He will argue as he has that tax rates in the Bush tax cut should expire for the wealthy. The definition of wealthy is 250000 and up. People like me think that's too low. It should be more a million and up. Uh, and that, that's what he'll say on taxes. He will also uh, be for corporate profits tax reduction, corporate tax reform, and base broadening closing of loopholes. There is a broad consensus intellectually and in both parties that U.S. corporate tax rates need to be cut to be competitive in the world and that we need to close some loopholes and broaden the base. Uh, so uh, if this prevails during the pre-November uh, congressional deliberations, then we may get some visibility on not having that $6 trillion deficit reduction. But politics in the United States, very, very, very wild. Uh, on the Republican side, it's clear that the, uh, Governor Romney, who is the governor of our state of Massachusetts, will be the Republican nominee. Uh, I breathe a sigh of relief. Uh, yes, I, I think there are press here. I would ask the press, if they are here, not to report on any political comments I make. Uh, the, uh, my own politics is independent, impartial, nonpartisan. I advise politicians in both parties I have for years, and I do not contribute to politicians nor to either political party. And so I will make freewheeling comments uh, about them. Uh, Governor Romney, uh, I would say thank God he's going to be the nominee given the rest of the candidates on the Republican side. Uh, this is a reasonably, this is a competent person. He is a technocrat. He has been relatively successful in business. He was a Republican in the, in the Democratic state of Massachusetts. We basically liked him as governor. His father was governor of the state of Michigan. I'm that old when I was a kid, George Romney. Uh, George Romney was a self-made millionaire, an executive. He was a good man. He came from a good family. Uh, Mitt Romney is clean at this point. He's clean of any of the sleaze that has surrounded so many of the US politicians in history. Uh, it, it was disheartening to see him do so poorly uh, in the early polling on the Republican side. For our country, can't nominate a halfway decent candidate, then we are really in trouble. President Obama is a fine man. He is a worthy candidate. Uh, in our country, there's a lot of disappointment 
with President Obama as an executive, as a leader. His background, as you know, is not as an executive. It comes from other places. Uh, my own assessment, he was poorly advised in economics, and he, he, he took the advice, and, and it didn't do well. I think he's changed. He is a very articulate, bright man. Washington has dragged him down into the mudslinging game playing of having to win an election. That's a charitable view of our president, and I do sincerely believe that. So I think these two candidates have the potential to give us in the United States an enlightened, articulate discussion of the big issues, the role of government, how big, how little, how much regulation, what form should it be, how should we deal with deficits and debt, what is our role in the world, what should our trade policy be, what about our allies, how do we behave internationally, issues, bright lights, articulate discussions of issues, that's my hope. And I think there's a good chance with these two people we can get that. Governor Romney has not so far slung any mud. Yeah, there's something called super PACs in the U.S. where the monies are used to sling mud at other politicians, so, but he's clean of that. He is not kind of that type of guy. We didn't observe that when he was governor of Massachusetts. Uh, he just doesn't look like he's that type of guy. President Obama, I think, if he's not in there slugging it out in Washington, will show us, I hope, what he showed us in 2008, which was this wonderful ability to articulate and raise our spirits in America for change in the future. He went to Washington to effect change. Washington did not change. It dragged him down. That's a big problem for a country like the United States. But I think out of this and out of how the candidates express themselves at this point, at this point, like Americans always are, I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic. I think we can work our way through and we can end up dealing with so many of these issues, particularly fiscal, in a reasonable way, despite the lay of the land at the beginning of the year. And so when I back away and we do asset allocation and look at stock markets, but there's more, we've, we've analyzed the Romney program, we know the Obama program, we know what the issues are, we know what they want to do in fiscal policy. There is much more agreement in the United States on things that need to be done than there is disagreement. The problem is the leaders of Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, appoint people who fight most, there is easy consensus on a lot of issues in the United States, and perhaps that will come to the fore. So uh, looking at beyond the election, thinking about forward-looking views on stock markets, we have, for the U.S., for the first time in years, the U.S., we have slightly overweighted against the MSC, MSCI index. That means you can buy the United States. We have it, in our view, we have it overweighted. South Korea is more overweighted than the United States is than the MSCI, and of course China is one of our long-term strategic uh, buys and, and picks. We are overweight in stocks from an asset allocation point of view. Uh, we have seen the worst of uh, the problems and the shocks in this economic cycle. Uh, looking at it, looking ahead, compared to last year looking ahead, it looks much brighter though the state of what happened in 2011 was really a very sorry state of affairs in so many ways, as I have chronicled around the world. So we are bright and optimistic on stocks. We're overweight on stocks. We're somewhat underweight on fixed income. Uh, we're uh, bullish uh, still to the tune of uh, 10 to 20 percent up on oil. And uh, we continue to uh, be overweight and to hold gold in our portfolios and to recommend it as a currency alternative because the uncertainty of the future of the U.S., of the Eurozone, and of Japan is so great that though I can be optimistic, cautiously so, looking ahead, I can't put my money where my optimism is because what counts is the bottom line, and I'm not willing to take a chance on the United States uh, or on Europe or on the uh, yen and uh, but I must tell you that in terms of the diversified basket of currencies, 
that is, and commodities, that is an alternative to the big three currencies, a theme that I mentioned last year, we're still on that theme, the South Korean won, except against a few Asian countries where your competition is very tough. Uh, we're still, uh, we would be buyers of the won, along with the Singapore dollar, along with the Chinese currency, uh, Australia dollar, Canadian dollar, no longer Swiss because they're tied to the euro. And if the eurozone breaks apart and we get a rationalization and a prospect for a small number of countries with a bright future, we would be buying the euro with both feet. So picture ahead for this country, relatively bright. Be happy you don't have to deal with the problems that the U.S. is dealing with. Make sure you don't let your leaders let you borrow too much money and get too much into debt. Do it yourself so you don't end up like one of those countries I talked about here today. Uh, and go about your business. Make all the money you can in the American, uh, South Korean, and uh, I have to say Chinese tradition. That's the way of the world for the future. Thanks very much. Uh, Euro countries are preparing a contingency plan that the Euro currency system breaks up. Uh, that includes the uh, UK and some other Euro countries. That what are ch what would be the chances that this Euro currency uh, system breaks out and uh, they return to the original currency? And if it happens, what will be the impact to global economy? Wouldn't that impact would be greater than uh, that of uh, 1997 financial crisis? I, I think they're, uh, they're high enough odds of a, of a breakup of the eurozone and a rejiggering of the currency uh, to think along the lines of the first part of your question. Uh, I do not think all countries will go back to individual currencies. And the reason is the original, the original reason for the Eurozone and the Euro, which was political, that is so well entrenched in, in Europe and in the leaders, that the more likely breakup scenario will be eight, nine, ten countries with a Euro. It's too well entrenched, it's too chaotic to totally disappear. And some other countries, which if there was a breakup, we would hope they plan it in an orderly fashion. And there are some, there are some contingency plans, certainly in the private sector, for this eventuality. I have always thought that the system as originally set up, particularly under stress, is for theoretical reasons, and also practical reasons. I always thought since I've thought this since 1999 that it could not could not stay. I still believe it. Uh, I think break up one way or the other is ultimately where it happens. And uh, how do I plan for it? I, I cut my investments <laughs> down uh, in Europe. We are underway. We moved our asset allocation out of Europe. If you're in business, not so easy. Not so easy. You're going to be stuck with the chaos of a break apart scenario and the problems of the downturn. But in business, you then look at that as a risk and you take action to minimize the risk to your bottom line. That I would encourage you all to do. The chaos of a break apart, there's no, there's no uh, orderly default, there's no orderly break apart uh, in this kind of situation. There never has been. It'll be chaotic, the markets will go wild. Uh, but, uh, you know, for a few days, and uh, uh, we will look at that depending on the situation's potential bargain time. Well, keep in mind that uh, when the uh, Greece is out of the Eurozone, he said uh, that time might be a good time to go in. That, uh, what yeah, you well, if that happens, uh, it happens or it doesn't happen the next week or two, then you've got to look and see what's going on with Portugal, then you have to look and see what's going on with Ireland. And the big question is, how does Italy finance all of his debt? They, they would be well advised to save their money, let Greece go, set up a transitional currency, give them a few bucks to get up and running again on their own, let a drachma fall to near zero so they get some help from the drachma, uh, let a, a decent leader figure it out, take the money uh, of the countries that are, that are putting money in the, the pot, that's the ESM now, establish that, use those funds to help Italy refinance its debt. And then if they did that, the ECB would be helpful. 
and Italy might get through this huge amount of refinancing it has to do, or, or, or get enough time to get its fiscal house more in order. It's a good leader in Italy, Mr. Monte, and Italy then can get back on a better footing and remain part of a Eurozone in Europe. That is the sensible business way to approach it. Most business people in this room would do it that way. Don't ask me why the politicians don't behave like business people. They never do. Thank you for your presentation because it was full of insight and full of indications for all of us. <clears throat> and first of all, thank you for the work, kind of words you spent for the Italian government at the beginning of the presentation and right now. A little bit less enthusiastic on the uh, description of the Italian debt. Uh, as you possibly know, the recent auction went very well. Uh, we are expecting for the rest of the first part of the year also successful auctions. And uh, uh, your presentation was based on the point of the growth as factor of uh, forecast for the future. Since the 80s, with the discussion of the uh, rational expectation, we know a lot of the way we address our decision in the, in the financial market. And uh, you quoted the many factors factors such as the Iran situation, uh, the Middle East uh, uh, turmoil, the US going down, the, the Eurozone crisis as factor which can affect our decision. My question is now this one. Don't you think that we are at a point where even the rating agencies here is going to become something more than an external observer and as a, as a sort of factor affecting the decision? It would be a big change in the general appreciation we have of the financial market and on the way we adopt decisions. Uh, is the time to think about on this aspect for the future of the world economy? Right. Thank you. Uh, and I side with the Europeans on this issue on the credit rating agencies uh, if, if for a couple of reasons. What I saw in the dynamics uh, of the process that led to the downfall of my former company and and the demise of so much of uh, what was intermediary finance uh, in the United States was the dynamics of the interaction of the traders in the markets selling short and the rating agencies and the criteria they used downgrading. Uh, we all knew about the markets and uh, you know, we knew that when the stock prices went down the rating agencies would say you need more capital. So we sold on that expectation and then of course that made things worse. We knew it would make things worse. Uh, we being those who, I don't trade uh, actually, but I'm talking about collectively the traders and investors. Uh, and then we knew when it was worse, uh, the balance sheets would contract, and the economy would do worse, and the financial institutions would do worse. The rate agencies would come back and downgrade again. And we expected that, so we sold the stocks on that expectation. And where does it all end up? It's a dynamic process that ends up, it's a road to nowhere. And so, uh, once again, we have the same process going on in the Eurozone. And so the role of the rating agencies and their active participation and even the timing of when they make the pronouncements really has to be questioned as a matter of policy and uh, taken a look at and probably changed. It's a negative part of the dynamic. They are still profit-making organizations. They're not public utilities. I have favored them as public utilities in the past. It is definitely part of the negative dynamic of Europe, just as is the lender conditionality, in my view, which is far too punishing in terms of conditions laid upon a country, which justifiably make people so unhappy that they rebel and revolt. So what do I, when I, I talk to the Italian press a fair amount, and uh, the, the conversation a week ago was, what do Italians think about this? We're doing all we can do and look where we are. They're so frustrated. They're so unhappy. Uh, and the rating agency contributes to it all being worse. Yeah, the government certainly plays a role. I did make a comment that my view was Mr. Monte was going to do a better job than Mr. Berlusconi. Uh, and, uh, and I do think that. And I think he's already demonstrated that so far. But the helplessness of the dynamics of the situation in which the rating agencies are involved invite uh, definitely at the examination of their role in all of this. We didn't really fully do it in Dodd-Frank in the United States. We didn't do it well enough at all. Uh, and we certainly should do it now. So I, I encourage the uh, policymakers and governments of, uh, of Europe uh, to say what they've been saying. 
which is the chastise the rating agencies. Notice the markets, though. See, the markets are the ultimate answer. Uh, since the downgrades, what's happened? The downgrades were irrelevant. <laughs> we all know exactly what's going on. You can't fool us, analysts. Governments need to know that. They need to be transparent. Uh, Mr. Berlusconi, for all of his appeal a, on a social level, was very unappealing from the point of view of an investor in terms of investing in Italy. Mr. Monte is quite a different kettle of fish. The markets are very smart. Too much money on the line by too many people. They do not get fooled. The debt uh, downgrade. They downgraded some more, the way the S&P and the other agencies do it. But the markets call the tune. Look at Japan. 0.9 on its debt. That debt's going to be downgraded. Look at the U.S. We were downgraded. Our yields are, long-term yields are down 50 basis points since we were downgraded. Look at the auctions after the downgrades was a one-day event in the financial markets. So the truth of what's going on, if you were not making progress, the Italian 10-year yield would be 8%. Not this morning, I think it was 6.45. So keep it up. I'm impressed by your optimistic and uh, positive outlook of the Korean economy for year 2012. And I agree with your reading of the Korean currency becoming undervalued. Uh, Related to this, I have two short questions. Question one, a small group of economists um, is considering the desirability of the Korean one currency becoming convertible in the global exchange markets. What uh, do you think of this? And question two, would Korea need to further <coughs> capital, uh, liberalize its capital markets? or slow down its openness if you want to maintain um, economic, I mean reduce, want to reduce the volatility of the Korean economy. Thank you. Uh, and a holder of something like $300 billion of foreign exchange reserves with a good budget and a, and a strong uh, tradable uh, good sector uh, ought to be more open on, on capital flows and open on capital markets. That in turn would increase the um, uh, one as a, an attractive uh, currency to hold and it would end up uh, getting more of a role in the currencies that are used in, in trade. Uh, and so uh, I, would, I would favor that. Uh, the Korean one is small in the foreign exchange reserves in, in, the, in the world uh, and I think I would side with a small group of economists who want to see a bigger role for that. It is for our clients one of the currencies because of the fundamentals that when they go and are afraid to be in dollar, yen, or euro, go to as part of a basket of currencies and commodities as the alternative. There's no one currency that is an alternative to the big three, but baskets of currencies and commodities, which include gold, which, which definitely includes gold, is how market people have gone facing uh, fundamentally what looks like difficult situations underlying the major reserve currencies, the dollar, the euro, and the yen. Um, in fact, Korea, uh, last week, uh, President Lee uh, agreed with the Chinese leader to uh, start a uh, to, to start an FTA uh, negotiation. And uh, if Korea uh, signs uh, FTA uh, uh, agreement with the China, Korea will be the first country to have FTAs with uh, the United States with the European Union and China. Um, but in, in fact, um, China has been a uh, very active uh, trade partner with Korea, so uh, there are some um, questions or doubts among the Korean experts that uh, whether Korea really needs China as a trade partner, as more more active trade partner. Uh, by the way, uh, Cor uh, Korean, uh, if the um, trade FTA is, uh, is um, signed with uh, China, uh, many experts say that agricultural sectors and uh, small and medium uh, firms will be uh, severely hit because uh, as far as agricultural products are concer uh, concerned, the, uh, the prices uh, from uh, the prices of uh, Chinese uh, agricultural products are really uh, very, very cheap. So uh, could you uh, have uh, share some of your thoughts with uh, Korea to be uh, the first uh, country? 
in agriculture between countries and trade is a very sensitive uh, subject. Uh, and uh, so in the nitty gritty of the agreement may be something that is not in Korea's interest with regard to its own agriculture production and exports of that product. And maybe more, if I looked at it, I might think it'd be more to the advantage of China. But I don't know the details of it, so it's hard for me to comment on that. And it's also a matter of political and public policy, and I'm, I tend to be very careful about making comments if I'm not fully informed. I'd be happy to look at it and uh, talk to you uh, another day on that. We should, one more brief question and brief answer, because I didn't answer his question. I hate to leave without answering the question. And briefly, because I haven't done one thing briefly yet today. So that's a goal here. I've got to see if I can answer something in 10 seconds that you asked. I'm okay. challenging you one more question. Give me something hard. <laughs> Thank you very much for sure. being with us today. Yes, and uh, we'll have another occasion perhaps next okay. year. Thank you very much for your active participation. Thanks.